You want me to move? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for, for coming along. Welcome to Blackfriars. Um, this is our first Thomistic Institute lecture of the year. Um, it's wonderful to see so many of you here. Um, great privilege to have kicking off the year for us, Father Philip Neri Reese, who's a, a Dominican friar, Catholic priest, um, and a, a philosophy professor at the Angelicum in Rome, which is the Dominican University based in Rome. Um, Father Philip Neri did his doctorate at Notre Dame on the demonstrative character of Aquinas's metaphysics, um, finished in uh, 2022, um, and is currently serving as the principal investigator on a Thomistic Institute, uh, Angelicum Thomistic Institute project in Rome on uh, philosophy, on Thomistic philosophy. Um, and he's here this evening to speak to us about logic and truth in God, nature and the artificial. Thank you very much. Great. So thank you um, to all of you for having me. It's a, it's a privilege to be here. Um, this is just my second time in Oxford. My first time was last year, and I was utterly and totally and completely charmed. Uh, so I was uh, ecstatic to, to get the invitation to come join you. Um, one word about this project. Um, you can consider yourselves for this evening my guinea pigs. Um, so this is, is a project that is... Um, especially at the end, um, exploratory, right? Um, and so, so Thomism is a kind of living tr philosophical tradition. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of this talk, you are just going to see me being a kind of exploratory Thomist. Um, the, some of the conclusions may be a little bit provocative, and you are only the second time I've ever publicly presented this. So um, I've had lots of debates with... Um, with uh, other Thomists uh, in private, but this is, I'm, I'm rolling this out now for public consumption. And, and I really look forward to your feedback and your questions because um, I'm not gonna die on this hill, right? So if I'm wrong, I would love to, to see why I'm wrong. Um, uh, but, and I think just as philosophers, it's helpful for us to, to think these things through. Um, so the, uh, when, when Brother John asked me for a title, I gave the title Logic and Truth in God, Nature, and the Artificial. And then after submitting that, I thought, there's a way better title for this, The Measure of All Things. Uh, so that is, so I made that the title um, and the official title, the subtitle. So what is this talk about? Um, my goal is twofold. The first goal is what I'd call an exegetical goal, right? So roughly, I think, um, in when we do the history of philosophy, we can uh, divide the questions that we ask into roughly three categories. There are exegetical questions. Did so-and-so think such-and-such? -such? There are systematic questions. Should so-and-so have thought such-and-such? -and, -such? and then there are speculative questions. Is such-and-such -such true, right? And we can pose all three of those questions and should really pose all three of those questions when we do the history of philosophy. And, um, and so particularly when we engage with the thought of St. Thomas. So the first exegetical goal is um, kind of low-hanging fruit, right? Uh, so I want to just give an account of St. Thomas's nuanced theory of truth. Um, the second goal is a systematic goal. I want to draw out some implications of that theory in ways that Aquinas never explicitly did. Um, and particularly, I want to draw out the implications of that theory for art, logic, and nature. Um, the, there is, in a sense, a third speculative goal. Um, and that is to suggest that that theory is, in fact, true, right? Both as it is exegetically presented and as it is systematically expanded. Um, as we move through those three goals, uh, they are put in a hierarchical order um, according to what I am most willing to die on the hill for, right? Um, so I am very certain that none of you will convince me that I'm wrong about the exegetical question. I'm like more confident than I probably should be that I'm right about the systematic thing. Um, I'm tentative about the speculative goal, 
Um, so I, I look forward to the Q&A on any of those three points. The structure of the talk is also fairly simple. I want to introduce the standard account that's given of Aquinas on truth. Then I want to nuance that account, and that's an exegetical nuance. I want to show that Aquinas's theory of truth is in fact more nuanced than the standard presentation claims. And then last, I want to speculate um, about some potentially provocative conclusions. Okay, so the standard account. I want to start with the standard account of truth, right? So not Aquinas' view of truth, just the standard presentations of truth. Um, so if you go to Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and look up um, art, the articles that it has on truth, many of them will say that the standard way to present theory of truth is that there are two theories. The first one is called the correspondence theory. Um, in general, all correspondence theories of truth will have this at their core. Truth, they say, involves a relation, specifically a correspondence relation, to reality. And that can take different forms. So one that is a little bit more classical and more prominent across the history of philosophy goes like this. Truth is the correspondence of mind and world. And that's a, a metaphysical version of the theory. A version of correspondence theory that's more common today, that's similarly metaphysical, goes like this. Truth is the correspondence of propositions with facts. There's also what you might call a semantic version of this theory that's a little bit less metaphysically robust. It goes like this. Truth is the correspondence of a sentence with what it signifies. All three of these example versions of the theory share in common the general core principle, right? Truth as correspondence. The second standard theory of truth is what's called a coherence theory. In general, coherence theories claim that truth involves a relation not with reality, but among the members of some sect. Uh, okay, what does that mean? Well, um, there is one and only one homegrown American philosophical movement. It's called pragmatism. A, prag a pragmatist or a pragmaticist, if your first um, account of coherence theory goes like this. Truth is a pragmatic entailment from the set of propositions believed by a given epistemic community. So you can think about what your community of knowers is committed to, and then you can think about, you can ask this question, what is pragmatically entailed by those commitments that we share? And those entailments, like the base propositions, are going to be different depending on what community of knowers you belong to. But maybe you think, Americans aren't very good at philosophy, so why should I think that's plausible? Um, well, here's a non-American version of, of co uh, coherence theory. Truth is strict logical entailment, not pragmatic entailment, strict logical entailment from the set of propositions delivered by our best scientific theories. That's... That's got a lot more objectivity to it, um, at least at first glance, than the pragmatic version of coherence theory. But maybe there are things about that that you worry about, and so perhaps you might put forward this as a different version. Truth is coherence with ideal science, right? So truth is whatever an ideal version of our science is committed to. All three of those are not correspondence theories, but coherence theories. Okay, now the standard account of Aquinas on truth. The standard presentation of St. Thomas makes two very simple claims. First, Aquinas was a correspondence theorist as opposed to a coherence theorist. And Aquinas's correspondence theory was a metaphysical version of the theory rather than a semantic one, right? Um, or perhaps it would be more accurate to say it was both metaphysical and semantic rather than merely semantic. Um, 
So he's a mind world guy, you might say, rather than just a, a sentence signification guy. Now, my exegetical claim is, um, is not going to object to either of those two claims because they have a really good evidential base, right? So St. Thomas says things like this. Truth is the correspondence of thing and intellect. Veritas est adequatio rei et intellectus. And if, if my translation of adequatio as correspondence worries any of the Latinists in the room, if there are Latinists in the room, then you can rest assured that in other passages um, that are less famous than the one from the Summa Theologiae, Aquinas uses conformitas, convenientia, and even in a few places, correspondencia, which is literally correspondence. And it's very clear that that sentence is metaphysically robust. It's not merely semantic. So I don't want to object to either of the two core claims for um, the standard presentation of St. Thomas. What I do want to say is that that's insufficient as a presentation of Aquinas's account of truth. In fact, St. Thomas's account of truth is much more nuanced. So, what are those nuances? I want to uh, invite us to think about the nuances involved in Aquinas's theory of truth as layered. So there are multiple layers of nuance, and we're going to take a little bit of time to peel back each layer one at a time. The first layer of nuance is that for St. Thomas, he thinks we, uh, in fact, our ordinary language obliges us to recognize a distinction between a primary sense of truth and a secondary sense of truth. Um, so his thought is this. Look, we use the adjective true in a lot of ways and with application to a whole lot of things. And um, when we do so, there's a kind of suppleness to our linguistic usage, right? Um, there are cases where when we use the word true, we mean it in a really robust sense. And there are cases where when we use the word true, we mean it in a less robust but still genuine sense. And he wants to give an account of truth that is um, responsive to that linguistic suppleness. So here's a big chunky quote. Uh, don't get scared. Uh, we'll, we'll take it bit by bit and then unpack it. So here's what he says. The completion of any motion or operation is in its end point. But the motion of a cognitive power terminates or has its end point in the soul. For it's necessary that knowledge be in the knower in a way appropriate to the knower. Whereas the motion of an appetitive power, a desiring power, terminates in the thing desired. And this is why, he thinks, Aristotle posits a sort of circularity to the soul's actions. So we start with the thing outside the soul that moves the intellect. Then the thing as understood in the intellect moves the appetite. It moves our desire. And then the appetite, our desires, reach out to the thing from which the whole process began and the circle is completed. Now, since good expresses the order of something to the appetite, whereas true expresses the order of something to the mind, the intellect, that explains why Aristotle says that good and bad are in things, whereas truth and falsity are in the mind. And then he adds, but a thing is not called true unless it corresponds to the intellect. And so, and this is an addition over and above Aristotle, Truth is found primarily in the intellect and secondarily in things. So he's thinking about the relationship between truth and goodness. He's thinking about a kind of asymmetry um, or a, a kind of mirror relation between the two. And he connects that up with the fact that we call some things um, true in a primary sense, namely things in the mind, and we call other things true in a secondary sense, things in the world, right? Um, so I can have a thought um, that that is true gold, right? That is truly gold. Um, and what I mean when I talk about a thing as true gold 
has reference to the judgment, the true judgment that I make about it being gold. Um, more on that in a moment. First, let's just think through these asymmetries. So, Aquinas is thinking about this roughly in the following way. The mind has a relationship to the thing that's a relationship of information, right? So the things outside um, in the world inform our minds. But the relationship of the will to the thing is the opposite, right? You can think of it uh, where the one is informative, the other is ecstatic, right? Um, so the will, the desires that we have, they, they launch us out of ourselves towards the things that we desire. So I've tried to capture that with the different orientations of the era. And you'll notice that in the information relation, what's primarily true is the mind, and what's secondarily true is the thing. But it's the opposite for the ecstasy relation, right? So what's primarily good is the thing that you desire. And then the will is good in a kind of secondary sense, insofar as it's, it's reaching out for the right, the kinds of things that it ought to desire. But we're not done with the nuance. So the second layer of nuance that Aquinas introduces is a distinction within the mind between practical ways of thinking and speculative ways of thinking. He says, we must understand that a thing is related to the practical intellect in a different way than it is to the speculative intellect. For the practical intellect causes the thing, that's like the, the artificial thing, and so is the measure of the thing it brings about. But the speculative intellect, because it receives something from things, that's the information relation, is in some way moved by those things. And so the thing is the measure of it, the speculative intellect. From this, it's clear that the natural things from which our intellect acquires knowledge measure our intellect. So with this second layer of nuance, what we notice is that um, the thing that we saw previously, the information relation from natural thing to mind, that's actually just the case for speculative intellect. When the kind of intellectual thought that we're thinking about is practical, it actually looks a little bit more like the will. Right, it it looks like a kind of um, uh, a transitive sort of relation. We're moving out of ourselves, because in practical intellection, the mind causes the thing in the world. The third layer of nuance here is this introduction of the idea of a measure. Right. So, in the case of speculative intellect. Our minds are measured by the natural things in the world. In the case of practical intellect, oh, it's cut off at the bottom, uh, it's the opposite. The mind is measured, um, and uh, the mind is the measure, and the artificial thing is the measure. So this is a little bit abstract. Let me use some examples. Um, raise your hand if you are a cat person. I see a couple cat people. Okay, brace yourself to now be offended. Um, so here are some truths about cats. Um, cats generally have hair. Uh, cats are not as good as dogs. Um, cats are traditionally associated with the devil, right? Um, cats will prevent you from getting married in proportion to the number of them that you own. Now, all of those truths, right, are truths about cats. And how do we know that they are true? Well, we know that those claims are true precisely insofar as they measure up to the things that they are claims about, right? So we have to look at the nature of cats. We have to look outside ourselves to the way that cats are, right? And we have to allow that to be the measure of our mind, right? Um, so no matter what you tell yourself, 
the more cats you have, the harder it will be to get married, right? And there's there's nothing that you can do um, to convince yourself otherwise that will that will change that from just being a cold hard fact, right? It's the world that's the measure of your mind, right? Um, practical intellect is a little different, right? Um, so suppose one of you um, says, you know what, Father Philip Neary, he's he's really right about that. Um, I do like hope at one time in the future to like have a spouse, so I should get rid of all these cats. Um, but you know, you look around your now empty apartment. Um, you know, it's catless, and you think I'm I'm still too deeply attached. So what I'm going to do is is I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of um, make a little compromise with myself. Um, so for every cat, real cat that I gave away, I'm going to whittle a cat out of wood. And I'm just going to put my whittled wooden cat somewhere in the apartment. Um, and, and that can kind of appease my, my deformed attachment. Um, <laughs> when you are whittling your wooden cat, your mind is the measure of the object, right? So it's possible for you to look at what you have whittled, the, the wooden thing. I can't do three W's track. Um, it's possible for you to look at the wooden cat that you have whittled and think, that's not what I intended to make. That's not truly what I had in mind. You know, that's not the true wooden cat, right? Uh, it didn't come out right. The measure of whether the wooden cat came out right is your mind, right? Your practical intellect what you as the artificer were intending and the artist were intending to make. And so things can fall short of our practical intellects in roughly the same way that our speculative intellects can fall short of the world around us. Um, this is what Aquinas is getting at with this notion of a measure. And I think this is a really interesting thing because in contemporary philosophy, we often talk about um, truth makers and truth bearers. And it seems to me that Aquinas's notion here of a truth measure is actually prior to and more basic than both. Because it's really, if Aquinas is right about this, it's really the notion of the measure that's determining what is the primary bearer of the truth um, and what is the primary maker of the truth. Um, so is the mind bearing truth primarily, or is the thing bearing truth primarily? Um, that's going to depend on what the measure is, and the and what the measure is is going to depend on the kind of thinking involved. So in speculative intellect, the thing is the measure of the mind. So the truth maker um, is primarily the thing outside us, and the truth bearer is primarily our thought and judgment about the thing. In practical intellect, the mind is the measure of the thing. So the truth maker is primarily you, the artisan, while the truth bearer is primarily the work of art, the thing you've made. But we're still not done. There's a fourth layer of nuance. And this is a distinction between divine mind and human mind. So St. Thomas says, natural things are themselves measured by the divine intellect, in which all things are like artifacts in the mind of an artificer. In this way, therefore, the divine intellect is a measure, but is not itself measured. The natural thing is, in one respect, a measure, and in another respect, measured. Whereas our intellect is measured by, and is not a measure of, the natural thing. Rather, our intellect is a measure only of artificial things. Standing therefore between two intellects, the divine and the human, the natural thing is called true insofar as it corresponds to either one. So we can apply tr the word true, the adjective true, to a natural thing either on account of how it stands to the divine mind or on account of how it stands to our minds. For insofar as it corresponds to the divine intellect, it's called true to the extent that it does what it was ordained to do by the divine intellect, right? So insofar as you measure up to God's plan for you, you are truly yourself. 
insofar as you fall short of God's plan for you, um, you are being false to yourself. But insofar as a natural thing corresponds to the human intellect, the natural thing is called true to the extent that is, it is apt to cause a true thought about itself in our minds. And it's false to the extent that it is apt to cause a false thought about itself in our minds. So false gold is false gold precisely because it's a natural object that is apt to cause us to make the false judgment, this is gold. Okay. So, the first kind of relationship here is divine practical intellect to natural things. So the divine mind causes the natural thing. The divine mind is the measure. The natural thing is measured by it. And in this case, the thing, the natural thing, is what's primarily true. And the divine mind is only called true vis-a-vis -vis a natural thing in a secondary sort of sense. It's the reverse for human speculative intellect. So our minds, when we speculatively know natural things, receives from the natural thing, and so is measured by it. And so in this case, what's primarily true is our mind, and what's secondarily true is the natural thing. But then we now have kind of the, the third asymmetrical relation. When the kind of thought that we're thinking about is human practical thought, it's our mind that causes the artificial thing. And so our mind is the measure. The artifact, the work of art, is measured by it. And so the work of art is what's primarily true, whereas our minds are only called true with respect to the things that we make in a secondary sense. So a few preliminary conclusions about which I am extremely confident. So first, yes, at this point, we are, we are in a good position to say happily that um, the standard account uh, of Aquinas as a correspondence theorist is accurate. Um, and it's obvious that he's a metaphysical kind of correspondence theorist. But the theory of truth that we've just seen in St. Thomas is much more than that. It's more than that because it's sensitive to the differences between quote-unquote correspondence with respect to practical and speculative thought it's sensitive to differences between correspondence in divine and human thought, and it's sensitive to the asymmetrical character of correspondence with respect to measure and measured. And all three of those things um, means uh, that it is going to be sensitive to what we call primarily true and what we call secondarily true in a particular context of thought, right? So if we're thinking about the way that God creates the world and the way that things live, like, you know, and particularly human actions are trying to live up to the divine plan, the assignation of primary and secondary truth is going to be one thing. If the context of our thought and investigation is just like contemporary science, learning about the natural world around us, the assignation of primary and secondary truth is going to be completely different. If the context of thought is something like art, literature, painting, dance, right? Again, primary and secondary truth is going to be different. That is an extremely nuanced, uh, and I would suggest to you extremely interesting um, theory of truth that is not at all captured by merely saying, Oh yeah, Aquinas is one of the best examples you can find of a correspondence theorist, um, which is in fact what some contemporary presentations have said and just left it at that. Now for the speculative expansion. So now I'm taking off my exegete hat and I'm putting on my contemporary Thomist philosopher hat, right? Um, and we're, so now we're going to ask ourselves this question. What can we do with this theory? 
what what possible provocative conclusions might this theory imply? Well, here's a potentially provocative uh, implication for logic. Our basic principle, something that we've already seen. Human practical intellect is the measure of the truth of an artificial thing, a work of art. Here's our potentially expanding observation. Well, human practical thought is sometimes undetermined or underdetermined with respect to things that could be determined. There are decisions about a work of art that an artist can make, but nevertheless might not make. And the unexpected conclusion for logic, LEM, the law of excluded middle, can fail, at least in the sphere of artificial things. So just to clarify some terms here, by law of excluded middle, I mean bivalence. Um, so it's, uh, it's a not unusual thing to distinguish the principle of non-contradiction from the law of excluded middle. So the principle of non-contradiction says um, some indicative proposition can't be both true and false. The law of excluded middle says every indicative proposition must be either true or false. So not both is a different claim from not neither. Law of excluded middle says not neither. Um, so just if you're freaking out and you think like Father Philip Neri is denying the principle of non-contradiction here, he's not, right? PNC holds even for this provocative, you know, expansion. The question is, can LEM fail? Can law of excluded middle fail? So can there be indicative propositions about which um, what is said is neither true nor false? By artificial thing here, I don't just mean like a painting or a statue. Um, I mean literally anything that is intentionally created by a human being, right? So literature will count as a work of art, an, an artifact in this sense, or an artificial thing, um, a dance, a symphony. Anything intentionally created by the human mind is going to be artificial in this sense. That's the sphere I want to suggest to you where the law of excluded middle can fail. But this is like a philosophy talk, um, and so if you thought you were going to get through a philosophy talk without any numbered premises, Sorry, here come the numbered premises. So, premise one. If the measure of a truth is undetermined, the truth is undetermined. If the measure of a truth is undetermined, the truth is undetermined. I think given everything that we've seen, if, if we understand the idea of a truth measure, this premise should be self-evident. But the artificer's intellect is the measure of the truth of the artifact. And this is just our Thomistic postulate, right? So we're being, I'm being a Thomist philosopher here. This is the principle that I'm importing from Aquinas. And from one and two, it immediately follows that if the artificer's intellect is undetermined, the truth of the artificial thing, at least that corresponds in that respect, is going to be undetermined. But look, sometimes the artificer's intellect just is undetermined. I think that's evident to anybody who reflects on it, right? But it's also provable, right? So here's the proof. Um, the human mind is finite. The number of potential determinations that could be make, made about any work of art is infinite. Um, ergo, there are certain um, determinations that could be made about any given work of art that are not made, as long as the mind in question is a finite mind. Which means sometimes the artificer's intellect is undetermined with respect to some aspect of the work of art. So sometimes the truth is going to be undetermined. That just follows from three and four. But if the truth of an artificial thing can be undetermined, then the law of excluded middle fails. That should be self-evident from what the law of excluded middle is and what it means to say truth is undetermined. Therefore, the law of excluded middle can fail. Okay, so for any like logic nerds in the room, that's going to be extremely provocative, right? Um, so maybe we need a three value, like if we want to give a complete and perfect account of um, truth and entailment in all that applies in all cases, then maybe we need to allow that um, 
that there are three truth values, not two. Um, so take that classical logic. Um, but what if, hypothetically, maybe, possibly, some of you in this room are not logic nerds, right? Uh, do any of these, uh, does anything that I've said have purchase uh, or, or something intriguing to say to you? Yes. I think there's a potentially provocative implication in this theory for art as well. So here's a little thought experiment. Um, suppose that three different attempts are made over the course of a thousand years to restore a statue's true colors. Is there an objectively right answer about which of those three attempts at restoration succeeds, right? Is there such a thing as the true colors of the statue? I think Aquinas's theory of truth, and specifically this idea of uh, the truth measure as changing um, depending on the practical or speculative and divine and human contexts, gives us a principled way to answer this question. So if the sculptor of the statue sculpted the statue with definite colors in mind, then whichever attempt at restoration restores those colors will be the successful restoration. Those are the true colors. The other restorations will yield the false colors of the statue. But if the sculptor did not intend uh, any particular or determinate colors for the statue that he or she is sculpting, then in fact, none of the attempted restorations yields either the true colors or the false colors of the statue. And we're in a position to see why, because the measure of the, tru the truth of an artificial thing is the mind of the artisan. If the mind of the artisan is determined with respect to, say, the colors of the statue, then that determination is going to be the measure of the truth of the statue's colors. You know, um, insofar as the statue's colors fade over time from the intended coloration of the, the artist, um, it is becoming less and less itself, right? It's becoming less and less truly the statue that it was made to be. But if the sculptor made no determination, then there is no measure for the truth of the claim, this statue should be red and blue. And if there's no measure for the truth, then there just is neither truth nor falsity with respect to that claim. Oh no, gave it away. This, I think, is the most pressing hermeneutical question of our day. And is the question that is most likely to be approached in contemporary hermeneutics, uh, at least for, for literary hermeneutics, um, without any kind of principle, right? Just as we are, we are going to like emote about how, uh, what we think about this on the basis of like maybe our like political affiliations, right? But I, the Thomist philosopher, am go I'm here to tell you, um, there is a principle for determining whether Dumbledore was really gay, right? Um, and it's roughly what we've already seen in the case of the statue. If J.K. Rowling really did determine Dumbledore's sexuality when she created the character and wrote those books, then yes, the version of Dumbledore that we were reading about was truly gay. Even if nothing written in the novels would make that determination for us, right? There's a difference between a, an indicative proposition having a truth value and our having epistemic access true to that truth, right? Suppose, as is in fact the case, nothing in the novels can determine for us as readers one way or the other, right? There's just no convincing indication, right? All that means is that the novels do not give you or I epistemic access to the character that was invented by J.K. Rowling at that time and who was 
written in and presented by the books. So if she really did make that determination when, when she wrote the books, then it really is the case that Dumbledore was gay. Even if nothing in the books gives us a firm basis for saying that that was in fact the truth. If, however, um, as is probably the case, Rowling did not really determine Dumbledore's sexuality when she was writing uh, the books and creating the character, and only made that judgment years later, right? The result would be the character in Rowling's mind now has this determination, but the character that she invents now is not the same character as the character that she invented then and wrote into the books, right? The version of the character that was initially created and written into the books was undetermined with respect to his sexuality. And insofar as the mind of the artisan is the measure of the truth of the artifact, and the mind of the artisan was at that moment undetermined with respect to questions of Dumbledore's sexuality, just as it was almost certainly undetermined with respect to the question of how many hairs there were on Dumbledore's head, right? Or whether Dumbledore had a mole on the small of his back, right? Just means that all of those claims, right? Dumbledore had a mole on the small of his back. Dumbledore had exactly 9,071 hairs on his head. Dumbledore was gay. All of those claims would be indeterminate with respect to truth or falsity. Why? Because there was no measure of their truth or falsity. Why? Because the mind of the artisan was simply undetermined with respect to those questions. So, to me, and I hope to you, that's a very provocative conclusion. Um, it's also potentially a very powerful conclusion for um, how we judge um, works of art um, and across uh, at how we engage in questions of hermeneutics, right? Textual hermeneutics. Um, but for now, um, I'm just going to stop and invite your questions. And thank you for listening.